So uh, again, welcome to the afternoon sessions. My name is Michael Gray. I am Director of Advocacy, the Treatment Advocacy Center, and it is my honor to facilitate uh, this panel and introduce these panelists. Uh, just a quick overview. This is a panel about uh, folks from uh, New Mexico, Texas, and Kansas. We're going to hear about what New Mexico has been doing to maximize uh, AOT program partnership with local law enforcement and how that benefits everyone in the community involved and touched by AOT. Uh, about how Texas is reducing the number of people waiting to be restored to competency by redirecting nonviolent offenders with uh, SMI to AOT. And last but certainly not least, um, how one judge in Kansas is making it his mission to grow and expand AOT in that state. With that being said, I will say there's a slight changes to your program for this session. We're going to go a little out of order, and we have some folks uh, filling in. Both uh, Laura Braun from New Mexico and Professor Brian Shannon from Texas Tech could not be with us today. But I'm actually pretty excited that we have uh, Michael Lucero from New Mexico instead, and Judge Oscar Kazin, who I think all of you are familiar with by now. And I, I'm actually, I, I am excited. We're going to hear a little bit more from him. And he's actually he's going to start us off. Judge Casey. OK, so thanks, guys. I'm back. I'm back. Um, I am a poor uh, substitute for the speaker you would have heard from today. Uh, Professor Brian Shannon is a, a light amongst us in Texas. Uh, how many of you actually know Brian or Professor, of Professor Shannon? Raise your hands. Okay, all of them will tell you and hold their hands up even higher that he is a great man and a great thinker and, and probably can do circles around anything I could do on the subject. However, uh, as he landed today, and I don't think he would mind that I share this with you, his mother passed away. And she was actually a former president of NAMI uh, here in Texas for many years. Um, and if you don't mind, just for a few seconds, uh, a moment of silence, prayer, meditation, zen, whatever you can send Brian's way, I would appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. And I know he felt it. And if you know anything at all about him, he felt it. All right. So in Texas, and we're going to go backwards, the tail end of the conversation is, what do you do once somebody's actually been arrested? What do you do once you get them there? What do you do once the system has failed and they've got pending charges? And we've been struggling with that in Texas, and I'm going to change his speech a bit to be more generic uh, so that maybe you can, the concepts you can take with you uh, to where you're not doing it, and why AOT is a, a nice glove that fits over diversion. Right. So in Texas, it's a little different. AOT can only be done, civil assisted outpatient treatment, in a probate court. And the very first thing that happens while you're trying to create this diversionary plan in Texas through probate courts is you get a whole bunch of probate judges who do guardianships, wills and trusts, fiduciary estates, uh, eminent domain, don't ask me why, condemnation cases, and mental health. But you get these judges who traditionally have never really had to do anything on the criminal side, all of a sudden being told, hey, we'd really like to incorporate you to move people out of the criminal justice system and over to your court. And let me add, without any funding. And to some extent, you get some pushback from the judges. And there's some things that we need to fix in Texas, and that is if we're going to move people from the criminal court system and over into AOT and the probate systems, perhaps some of the monies on the criminal justice side that would have funded their treatment in prison, in jail, through the context of jail, should follow them over to the mental health side. Good idea, right? But the thought that AOT could help is the thought that we're speaking to. So let's think about that. Oscar was just... Uh, charged with an offense. Uh, he kicked a pot over on the San Antonio Riverwalk. 
In his delusion, he yelled at the pot. The police officer went uh, to arrest him, and he struggled against the police officer, having glanced against the police officer's shoulder sufficient that it did cause pain, and he was arrested, either just for the criminal trespass or the punch. Let's start with the criminal trespass. If Oscar in Texas got arrested for that criminal trespass, <clears throat> normally I would go to jail for about three days. And then I would be marched promptly down to the prisoner court and they would look at my class B misdemeanor. They would ask me if I was indigent, which I probably am, and I'll be given credit for time served, off you go. The officers then are making the same call probably on Oscar, unbeknownst to everyone that he might be mentally ill, oh, about a week or two later, all right? But they're in, they're out. He kicked a pot on the river walk. It's okay. But if Oscar kicked that pot in the middle of a delusion and he went to jail, how likely is Oscar to find a bondsman that'll make a bond for him? Zip. How likely is the prosecutor and the judge willing to say, you think you're uh, Attila the Hun and you want me to approve a bond? Zip. Oscar will probably sit in jail, and the minute I'm in jail, a lawyer's going to come visit me, and that lawyer's going to say, something's not right with Oscar. I'm not going to put my license on the line. I'm not going to plead this guy out at the prisoner court. He doesn't even know who he is. I think he's incompetent to stand trial. In Texas, and I don't know about your jurisdiction, that means that now I have to have my competence restored. And up until not too long ago, th thanks to Professor Shannon, a lot of this has changed, uh, I sat in jail on a misdemeanor for more than six months, more than I possibly could have been punished, day for day, because there is no room at the inn. In Texas, for example, if we're going to divert somebody, not divert somebody, but treat them so they can be prosecuted, we actually have, I think, almost 2,000 individuals sitting in jail waiting for one bed. Think about that. So as a result, what do we do? We start creating diversionary tactics. You can either do the diversion at the jail once they're there. We wrote a law in Texas that says, thanks to Brian, by the way, for this, that says that you can't keep somebody or punish them longer than they possibly could have been jailed, and the judge can take good time credit, and the judge shall dismiss the charges after you get to at least a month or two. It's a good thing. We got people out, but what happens if it's a felony? And what happens if that felony is punishable up to 10 years? That same individual is now waiting years to get treatment. One of the answers that Texas did in diversion was to do what is called uh, outpatient competency restoration, where a judge says, I deem you incompetent, but we're going to wrap a team around you, and we're going to place you on assisted outpatient treatment. Now, hopefully you'll become, or forgive me, on a treatment plan. Now, hopefully you'll become uh, uh, restored in that time, and in many instances they are. But what if you want to dismiss the charges altogether? What if you truly believe that I believed, remember that, that, that example earlier, that I was married for 37 years? Is that really my fault? Do the ends of justice serve that I should be in jail this whole time and locked away in a prison when I honestly think I'm married for 27 years? That's the reason I kicked over the pot on that porch. Perhaps dismissal of the case is in order. How do you dismiss a case? There are victims. There are law enforcement goals. There's community justice and safety. Well, one of the options, again, that you can look at is dismissal. But if you're going to dismiss the case, where in the heck are you going to send them? And that's where, in Texas, as, may, as in many of your jurisdictions, two things have, have begun to develop. The first you already have seen on the criminal side. It's called criminal mental health court. Okay. And that basically says you're on probation, you're in front of me, and you've got to do all these things or you go to jail at any given moment. And it's better than nothing. I used to be a, a, a felony, a, 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 a drug court judge, not felony, a, a drug court judge in, in San Antonio, and it makes a difference. You can get maybe the charges dismissed in the end, but it's still a criminal process. It's still criminal probation. You heard the, the discussion earlier about the differences between AOT. So how do you divert them? Another option is that you could, if they meet that criteria, and this is something that needs to be very clear that's not often made clear enough. Out there, you will always hear, and somebody will always protest, 
you should not mandate treatment. Because treatment is something you should volunteer for and only volunteer for, and AOT makes those people go to treatment. That is an absolute fabrication. You don't just go on AOT because you're mentally ill. You don't go on AOT because you've got a history. You don't just go on AOT uh, because you're likely to deteriorate. And you don't just go on AOT because without treatment you become dangerous to self or others. It's all four of those. You gotta have that serious mental, I'm gonna paraphrase it. You have to have that serious mental illness. You have to have failed in treatment repeatedly, not recognizing that you need treated repeatedly. Okay, and there has to, typically, and there has to be testimony from a doctor that without treatment, you're likely to deteriorate to the point that you become dangerous to self or others in most jurisdictions. It has to be all of those things. The people who are against this are the individuals who will, who, will, who will tread on your fear. If you could do it voluntarily, then you don't need to be an AOT at all. That, you know what the answer to that is? Absolutely true. That is not who goes on AOT. AOT is for that core of individuals, for Oscar, who continually fails to do treatment, and every six months is gonna be out on that river while kicking over a pot, or punching an officer. If you want to dismiss the charges, in Texas we are now working towards, and it's gonna take some time, figuring out how we can dismiss the charges and put them on a civil outpatient treatment. We're gonna run into the same problems all of you in each of your jurisdictions are. That is, judges who aren't typically criminal court judges wanting to take a docket, that might be criminal. But if you're in this business to help others to better their lives, you should be willing to try. I see some judges here and individuals here who have made huge differences in people's lives with AOT. So as a diversion, AOT can work. But all the, 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 the sources have to come together. Now, having said that, one could argue in Texas, for example, why not AOT anyway? If they meet criteria, make the application, and if they meet criteria for AOT, then they should be treated uh, within the, the, the jurisdiction of the probate court that, that gives you your assisted outpatient treatment, right? Uh, and again, that's, that's what we're pushing towards in Texas. We're trying to figure out how to do three or four things, and I think we're almost there. That last component where we're going to take people, dismiss their charges, and put them in a, in a probate court, for example, it's gonna be a slow road. I, I believe we'll eventually get there. But that's one. Two is, figuring out how we can use the AOT model in the criminal courts as a mental health treatment court. Three is taking them out of jail so that we can monitor them with a judge or a program, okay, uh, while they are out pending charges until such time as they're, they're restored without having to go to uh, an inpatient facility, okay, or until such time as uh, the prosecutors feel that, okay, I've got enough now, I think we can dismiss the charges. It's a long road, but AOT has the potential, I think, to make a difference in the way we move people through the criminal justice system. It also has the potential at the beginning, if we can make it work, to say, we're dismissing the charges outright, go over to that judge, he's gonna assess you for, for treatment. And if you, don't make, if you don't meet criteria, well, here's your appointment with the local mental health authority, go get your help. That's really the goal so that the prosecutors can make that decision up front without going through the whole criminal justice system. I am gonna break protocol and ask, uh, Brian, anything, because you're, 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 I'm putting you on the spot, anything I should have mentioned by way of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just would maybe phrase, frame the last one you said <clears throat> a little differently, right? I, I would not expect the prosecutor to dismiss the charge without knowing that the person is gonna, you know, without having the confidence is gonna be accepted into the AOT program. And then kind of leaving them in a situation where they, they're only going to do treatment voluntarily or not at all. And then you've forfeited whatever leverage that criminal charge might have presented. Yeah, if you, if you are, and that's a good point, because if yeah. you are going to dismiss the charges, one could argue it's probably better to keep the charges in the background just in case. But one or, could, or, or, or but dismiss one could them. also argue dismiss right. it outright. Right, or dismiss them after there's been an evaluation that the person meets the AOT criteria, so then you know that there's going to be a court monitoring them and that there's going to be some accountability there. So you build a process yeah. where someone goes, Oscar goes to jail, he gets assessed at the jail when he gets arrested, and they say, you know what, you do meet criteria for AOT, and then the decision is made to, to dismiss the charges up front knowing that they meet the, the prosecutor has said, I think I've got a good chance of putting you in the AOT yeah. uh, program. Right, exactly right. 
Yeah. So I hope that helps a little bit. I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna leave you with. I'm gonna leave you with one last, just a silliness and joke, because um, everybody should laugh just a little bit on these serious topics. Do you mind? Thirty seconds. So, all of this stems from the first question, why in the heck is a court involved in treatment? Because ultimately it is about your liberty. Ultimately it is about your right to say, I don't want to be put away, whether it's for my own good or not. You have the right to say that. You have the right to challenge it. You have the right to due process. A silliness is this. Do you know what the worst thing that can happen to a 60, well back then, a 50 year old man is? A recently retired father because he had nothing better to do than call me every freaking day. And, and every conversation ended like as if we were dating. You hang up. No, you hang up. <laughs> so he said, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm in the middle of a trial. What kind of trial is it? It's a criminal trial. Well, what is it? I said, oh, some guy tried to put his wife in, a, in an asylum for divorcing him. And I'm going to back up. It is against the law in Texas to put your wife in an asylum because she divorced you. <laughs> um, he was being prosecuted. Uh, he got convicted. The young lady, it turns out, divorced him. He went downstairs, filled out a warrant application, an application for commitment. He said, my wife is crying profusely. I don't think she's gonna make it through the night. She needs to be detained. She went through the process. Well, guess what? Because of the process, they got to ask her, what's wrong? She says, nothing. Says, well, it says here you were crying profusely. I was, those were tears of joy. <laughs> I divorced him, he didn't divorce me. And they discharged her. It worked. The system saved somebody from being prosecuted or detained that they shouldn't have. Fast forward and go back to my dad. My dad says, so what are you doing? I said, well, some guy tried to put his wife, it's a jury trial, some guy tried to put his wife in the asylum uh, for divorcing him. And there was a long pause and my dad answers, there's something wrong with that? <laughs> my last call was to my mother. Thank you. That's Judge Oscar Kazin. No, no, no. That's a good way to end that section. And next to begin, we're going a little bit out of order, but uh, next up is going to be uh, Judge Robert Winnell from Kansas. He's going to talk about the work he's doing to expand AOT in that state. So, Judge, please. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, I'll end with that then. No. no. I wasn't expecting the applause. Thank you. So to tell you a little bit about building partnerships and kind of give you a better example of what I'm going to be speaking about, I need to tell you a little bit about myself. I am Rob Winnell, I'm a district court judge in the state of Kansas. I'm assigned to Johnson County, which is one of the greater Kansas City metropolitan area counties. We have about 750,000 people. We're a large county. And as I've grown to meet many of you, and I, I want to meet many more of you, my contact information is in your information. My last slide is my email address. I want to get to meet you more because the thing that I'm going to be talking about today about building partnerships, it's about building partnerships with you. These are the types of, of workers, of stakeholders, of individuals that have to be at the table if we're going to really see some advancement and change. You're going to hear throughout this conference from some great individuals that have been doing this for 5, 10, 15, 20, 40 plus years. And I will tell you that my journey into the behavioral health world and its intersection with the justice system began in the fall of 2019. So I'm a little bit newer to the game. I've been on the bench for almost eight years. And in the first four and a half years I was on the bench, I had a 100% simple, nothing but family docket. And that's all I did for four and a half years. And, if any, and I know that many of you have experience with family dockets and behavioral health world. When you are a family court judge and it's all you do, you are absolutely on the front lines. You are there. You are there with the brokenness, with the problems, the conflict, serving the public. After four and a half years, I took over a civil docket. And when I say civil, I'm not necessarily talking yet about civil commitments or care and treatment. I'm talking about a civil docket. I'm talking about contract disputes. I'm talking about litigation, slip and falls, those types of things. And as I was doing the civil docket, our Chief Justice asked me to attend a, a summit in Deadwood, South Dakota. It was part of a regional effort from the National Center for State Courts about addressing the court and community response to the issue of mental illness. And I attended that summit in Deadwood, South Dakota with no interaction previously in the behavioral health world 
and the justice system. And I left that summit saying, what can I do? And the first thing I did, and my colleague from Texas is exactly right, you're going to find these cases in the probate code wherever you go. I went to our probate judge and I said, can I have the care and treatment docket? And when I say care and treatment, I mean the civil commitment docket. That's what we call it in Kansas. I said, can I have that? Because I knew if I was going to get in this, if I was going to get back in the front lines like I'd been in family court, I had to have some skin in the game. I had to know what was going on. I had to serve in some of these types of cases. Shockingly, our probate judge said yes. He said, take them. Go ahead. They're yours. <laughs> and I took them. And that's where it started. Uh, about two months later, uh, a predecessor of mine had just started an AOT program. He got it up and running. He did it for a month, and he said, I'm retiring. Here you go. <laughs> and I've been doing it for about two years now. But the success that we have is about building partnerships, and that's what we're going to talk about today in this particular section. When I left that summit in Deadwood, South Dakota, which had 13 states, had at least one member of the state Supreme Court, we were the only state there, Kansas, that only sent judges. And I realized that was an issue as I met with the other jurisdictions. And so we came back with two directives from the Deadwood, South Dakota summit. Number one, learn what we didn't know. We didn't want to recreate the wheel. We wanted to know what was going on in the state. And number two, we wanted to try to reproduce a summit like we had just been at, but for Kansas. All 105 counties, just like they'd brought 13 states to Deadwood, we wanted to bring all 105 counties to a summit in Kansas. Directive number one, learn what we don't know. There was so much going on. Governor's Behavioral Planning Council, the Special Committee on Mental Health Modernization from our legislators, the Criminal Justice Reform Commission, we started to get to meet them. We started to learn what they were doing. What could we do to supplement or add to what they were doing, not replace what they were doing, or start just another task force that competed with what they were doing? First step, and this is January of 2020, right? We're in the middle of virtual meetings for everything. First step, I had a Zoom call with our governor, and I asked Governor Kelly if she would appoint some people from the executive branch to help me plan a summit. Then we met with a senator and a member of our a legislator from our house said, would you be part of this planning commission? We brought everybody in in this planning process, had about 13 people, high-ranking policy stakeholders from all three branches, because if we were gonna have any change, it was gonna require a three-branch effort. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that from a building state and local partnerships perspective when we talk about the state level. Then I'll get to the local level. So at a state level, we've gotta have the legislative, executive, and judicial branches working together. And I'm gonna give you one small story from that planning process that I think is magnifies what we're talking about here. We had a representative, one of the highest ranking representatives in our house in, in Kansas, in part of the planning process, she says in the middle of a meeting to which our Chief Justice also appeared, she said, you know, Chief Justice Luker, I've come to the realization that my committee, she chairs the Special Committee on Mental Health Modernization for the state. She said, I've come to the realization that my committee has no judicial branch involvement. And she said, and that was an error. And so we have someone in an, in an open meeting saying, I've made a mistake by not involving the judicial branch. And she said, Justice Lukert, would you appoint some individuals to start serving on our committee? And she did, and we did, and we do. And I know that may sound like a really small story, but I don't think it is. I think when you have branches of government that have historically not necessarily worked well together, starting to say, we're only gonna achieve this if we work well together, I think it's significant. So what happened in this summit multi-branch planning committee that we had. Well, we had the summit, and I'm gonna show you the picture that was from most of the press that covered the summit. I'll go through a couple of these bullet points, but then I'll tell you the significance of this photograph. As I said, national initiative, I've already talked about the two directives that we had. Multi-branch planning committee, I've already talked about that. We had over 500 people attend our summit. We had about 150 to 175 in person. The rest were virtual. But let me tell you what's significant about that. I think that number itself is significant, but I think what's even more significant is this was kind of a pseudo invitation only event. And what I mean by that is we didn't exclude somebody that wanted to register to be there, but we didn't necessarily just post this for everybody. We were intentional, intentional on our solicitation of our guests. We had the chief judges in all 31 of our judicial districts build a team a team of law enforcement, corrections, judges, attorneys, faith leaders, 
mental health providers. We had them build these teams and we invited them to come participate in this summit. Now, I want to introduce some very important people in this picture to you. This individual right here is Laura Kelly. She's the governor of the state of Kansas. She's a Democrat. The person next to her is Senate President Ty Masterson, President of the Senate, Republican. The individual next to him, Speaker of the House, Ron Reichman, Republican. The person next to him, Chief Justice Marla Lukert, nonpartisan. These four individuals, the four highest ranking individuals in our state, came together for this purpose, to open our summit and address it. And I will tell you what's even more amazing than that, is they all four took the stage, made their comments in support of what we were there for, without any negative comments about anybody else. There's one other person in this photograph I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out there. No, that's, that's the person introducing them, which is, it's actually me. Um, <laughs> so I, I was giving this presentation to some high school honors kids back in Kansas, and one of the students said, why did they cut your head off? And I said, I don't know. I mean, I've been told my whole life I have a face for radio, and so I think maybe, <laughs> maybe this is, is why they chose to do that. Now, just in case you didn't believe me, I actually wore the exact same suit. So if I <laughs> lean like this, you can kind of see that's really me. And, and I do own more than one suit, but I wanted you to know that I was in that picture because right before we went on stage, the five of us were standing alone, and Speaker Reichman says to Governor Kelly, you know, I don't think we've ever done this. And Governor Kelly said, you're right, we haven't ever done this. And they had civil discussion, they were kind to each other. No one could see, but when they got done, Senate President Masterson helped Governor Kelly down off the stage. I mean, this is what it's supposed to look like. And this is what it can look like, no matter what political party you're a part of. This is the type of multi-branch collaboration that's gonna effectuate change. I also wanna tell you about our summit that we had all 31 judicial districts represented at the summit. And that is significant. Because just like in every other state, we have rural, we have frontier, we have large, we have it all. Not every single plan or program is gonna work in every single setting. But we brought everybody together to talk about what might work, what resources are available. We had personal impact statements from, lived, from, from individuals with lived experience. We had the Chiefs team clinician. The Chiefs are one of the few pro sports teams that have just like they have a director of physical medicine, they have a director of mental health who's there, he's a coach, he's there every day. He came and spoke. The Royals broadcaster, Ryan Lefevre, who wrote a book about major depressive disorder, came and spoke. This was an event for Kansas, and it was wonderful working together as three branches. I can update you the very bottom bullet point. It says 26. I can tell you we have 29 of the judicial districts have established a multi-branch community of practice. And the reason we did that was we didn't want our summit just to be a conclusion. We wanted it to be a catalyst. And we have 29 of our 31 judicial districts that are meeting. Stakeholders, just like I talked about, they're meeting at least quarterly. They're sending reports to me, and on November 14th, we will have our state delegation meeting. High, multi-branch leadership will be at that meeting to discuss what all the judicial districts are telling us they need and what's going on. It, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is how it's supposed to work. The last thing on there, I have real-time collaboration, and I tell everybody, this is a conduit of communication. We haven't added a new task force. What we've done is made a conduit of communication. I'll give you one small example. Municipal police officer in Kansas were a mandatory arrest on DV cases. What that means is police officer on the scene, domestic violence, somebody's got to be arrested. One of the two has to be arrested. Mandatory. This municipal police officer came up to me and said, is there any way the legislature would consider a reasonable belief expectation by the officer of a mental health crisis. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, when I'm there and I think it's a mental health crisis, someone's gotta leave, I understand. I'm not asking the legislature to change it. But can they add a reasonable belief of mental health crisis so that I can remove them to crisis stabilization instead of arrest? Now what's significant about this multi-branch community of practice is that question's now on the agenda for our legislators to talk about. Now I'm in the judicial branch. So I don't make the laws, I apply them. But I'm happy and I'm excited to be part of an organization where the legislators are gonna look at that question. I don't know what they're gonna do. But we have this conduit of communication that's gonna bring these questions, and I've got others, I won't tell all of them to you, but I've got others. I'm excited about our November 14th meeting. 
This is the type of state level partnership that I think can happen in every single state. And if you want to try to do this in, this in your state, you've got my contact information. Please reach out to me because I would be happy to give you a step-by-step -step instruction of how we did it. All right, oh, that's the wrong button. Sorry, Speaker Reckman. All right. All right, state level, talk a little bit about local level, and I've kind of talked about that a little bit already, but we have the stakeholders that we brought, and this list is including but not limited to. And you can see, I'm not gonna read, but it's the individuals that I talked about about bringing the stakeholders together. There are more individuals than in the eight circles you see. You may already exist in a circle outside of one of those eight circles. If I put everybody, the font would be too small and you wouldn't be able to read it. So I picked those eight, but the point is, anyone who has involvement with the intersection of behavioral health and the justice system is part of the local partnership and needs to have a seat at the table to discuss these issues. In your title, it talks about building state and local partnerships and expanding AOT. So I'm going to end with that. Expanding AOT in two ways. Number one, across your state. But number two, what can the AOT model, as my colleague from Texas indicated, potentially mean in other courts? I'm going to tell you what we've been talking about in Kansas. As far as expanding AOT in Kansas, we're, we're really excited about six of our counties. Six of our counties are in a pilot program with SAMHSA. They've launched AOT. Five of the six have launched AOT. Many of them are here, so if you see anybody from Kansas, talk to them about their AOT program. We've had a lot of discussions. I've discussed, had discussions with their judges. We've had a lot of communication about what it looks like to get an AOT program up and running. So we're expanding the AOT program across the state. But we're also looking at whether or not we can expand the AOT model into non-AOT, traditionally non-AOT type of settings. What I mean by that, here's AOT data just a little bit from our program in Johnson County. 125 attendees, the program began in 2019, 10.5 months, and then you've got the disorder breakdown. But the bottom three are what I wanna point out. And this won't really be a surprise to a lot of you because you're seeing similar results because AOT works. But in our AOT program, and we've got over two years of data now, only 29% have had a subsequent hospitalization. That's since beginning the program, not just since leaving the program, since beginning the program, only 29%. Only 16% have had a subsequent arrest since beginning the program. And I've already talked about our six other counties. Now, if you have any more questions about this data, I will tell you if you look on your program, we're actually presenting about this data collection in the next breakout session. We have uh, Major Michael Olson here from Johnson County Mental Health Center is gonna be talking about our data collection methods. So that's a little plug for, for his presentation next. I just wanted to give you this slide for one purpose in what we're talking about here today though, and that is this data has started to catch the attention of people in our county. County commissioners have reached out and asked me questions about this kind of data because the question is being presented, can we see that kind of data outside of a civil outpatient treatment order? So what we are working on building in Johnson County, and we're saying building because we don't have it yet, although we did just get a BJA grant to try, we're working on building a global behavioral health court that expands the AOT model into any time an individual with a behavioral health need meets the justice system. Mental health diversion already exists in our county. Competency to stand trial obviously already exists, but can it be handled in a different manner? Can it be handled in a manner where we look at potential outpatient treatment or AOT instead of the criminal process? Civil commitment, we already have, whether you call it care and treatment, or civil commitment, but, but we're not just gonna stop there. What about family litigation? What about where SMI so permeates the parent or the child that they can't even get a parenting plan done? What if they could go into a culturally competent model of AOT in family litigation? Post-sentence pre-revocation, this already exists in many courts nationwide. Wyandotte County, Kansas has a great post-sentence pre-revocation program. What if that can be incorporated in AOT? The concept of a global behavioral health court that addresses any intersection between an individual with SMI and the justice system. And then once we have that up and running, can we expand it to juvenile? That's what we're looking at right now. Now, this is what we're building. Maybe at some future AOT symposium, I can come back and say, this is what it looks like and we've done it. But this is what we're building right now. And by building this, it's only happening with those partnership level meetings, and we're having a lot of them but they're good and they're productive and they're not just meetings for meetings. 
and we've involved every one of the stakeholders to try to figure out how we can establish a global behavioral health court. And I am, I am almost done, but I'm excited about expanding AOT in that way. This is my last slide, other than my address. And this is why I put this slide on here. I've talked to a lot of people that have come up to me and said, we'd really like to do AOT, we're excited, we don't have judge buy-in. If you're a judge here, well, if you're a judge here, you're already bought in. Don't underestimate a judge's willingness to be involved in this type of program. Don't underestimate a judge's accessibility to be able to sit down and talk to you about this process. But if you have a judge that says, this is not what we're supposed to be doing in a very respectful way and maybe find another judge to deliver this message, you can tell them about this resolution. You may not know about the Council of Chief Justices, but it's an organization of 57 of the highest ranking judicial officials in the United States. All 50 states, Guam, Puerto Rico, US territories, they have a Council of Chief Justices. This summer they met and they unanimously approved this resolution. This is a directive to every judge in the United States of America that we are to that's, that's me, that's not every judge. I hit the wrong button. <laughs> that we are to, and I don't ever when I present read slides, but I'm gonna read this one. Because judges have just been commanded by our chief justices to lead, create and support state level interbranch mental health task force, and encourage and support local judges and courts in the creation of local or regional mental health task forces. Consider the appointment of a behavioral health director, administrator, and a team within the administrative office of the courts to develop and implement improved court responses for court-involved individuals with serious mental illness. This is the unanimous resolution of the Council of Chief Justice as to what judges are supposed to be doing. If you're here and you're a judge, you know this. Other judges are willing to listen to instruction from the Council of Chief Judges. Judges, for whatever reason, are an integral part of this process. And you can call it the black robe effect, but when, when a judge calls a meeting, people tend to go to it. Every, when you become a judge, everybody laughs at your jokes. <laughs> Sometimes. The point is, is that judge leadership can really help expand an AOT program. If you want anyone to reach out to a particular judge, talk to the judges or who are here. Some of them I've met, some of them I haven't, but I can almost guarantee you they'd be willing to have any conversation with judges across state lines about the value of AOT. I think you'd be surprised at how many judges out there are willing to invest in this, especially when they see the data. I do wanna leave some time for questions, so I'm gonna end my last slide with my email address, it's also in your materials. If you have any questions, if you wanna have any conversations, if you wanna build a partnership with Kansas, please reach out to me and thank you for your time. Thank you, Judge, thank you so much. And yeah, in the interest of time, uh, we are gonna have some Q&A, but, but last and absolutely not least, we have uh, Detective Cassandra Bailey and Mr. Michael Lacero from New Mexico. They're here to talk about the role of law enforcement and AOT in their community. And uh, if you could tell us briefly what you do and then we can take questions. You can take the podium or keep your, I don't tell police officers what to do, <laughs> ever. So you can <laughs> sit there and take the podium. Just tell us what you do and then we'll move on to Q&A, please. Thank you. Hi. Is this on? Uh, Hi, uh, I'm Detective Cassandra Bailey. I work with the Albuquerque Police Department. Uh, currently, I'm assigned to the Crisis Intervention Unit. I'm a detective. Um, I have a little over 19 years as law enforcement. The first 15 I spent um, in the field, as we refer to as Field Services Bureau, uh, which is basically uh, your beat cop taking 911 calls for service. Um, so I was asked by Laura Braun um, to just kind of speak on how we've collaborated with AOT. Uh, with the crisis intervention unit. And I'm not sure how many law enforcement we have in the room. How many? I know this table. Just, oh, okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, and just 
now that it's obvious, um, my <laughs> half of my team is here, my sergeant, my lieutenant, a couple of our clinicians, and um, they came along for the ride. Uh, <laughs> but um, just to give a quick brief overview of what our unit does, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with what a crisis intervention unit or team does for law enforcement, but we, um, our unit consists of 12 detectives. Um, we have two licensed clinicians. Um, we have outreach specialists. We have a psychiatrist on staff. And um, uh, our, our detective unit is split up between coordinators who solely take care of training, stakeholders, um, our cadets, our police department, um, college students, uh, you name it. And then we have eight um, what we call follow-up detectives. So anytime a field officer takes a call for service and feels that someone could benefit from a behavioral health follow-up, um, they will send the report to us. That report goes to our sergeant and he reviews it and it gets assigned to a detective. Um, we also re receive referrals in other ways from some of the stakeholders in the community, hospitals, um, you know, different other platforms that will send us uh, referrals, but that's basically what we do. Um, I want to say back in 2019, we learned about the AOT program in Albuquerque, New Mexico. They came into presentation to our unit because they know we solely deal with behavioral health. Um, uh, follow-up. Again, we are not first responders. We're the follow-up. So um, we were really excited about it. Uh, I and my colleague here as well, he'll introduce himself. He um, can speak to the clinical side of it. But I, as a law enforcement officer, was very excited about it because we get a lot of our frequent callers. And we get to know them. Our field officers are calling us about them. This person is at it again, and we're like, well, we just took them to the hospital. And, and sometimes getting these people to the hospital, I've always said people, somebody in the behavioral health community doesn't want to go to the hospital like somebody in the criminal system doesn't want to go to jail a lot of the time. And they need that extra support or to feel that extra support. And when they see us over and over and over again, they start to feel like, OK, these people actually do care. They're not just here for a 911 call. And the AOT collaboration was amazing because of we would start to identify the people that would um, meet the criteria. And I'm sure every state might be different. But for our city, when they would meet the criteria for AOT program, the serious mental illness, um, frequent hospitalizations, or going to jail, um, we as our unit would kind of pick up on that and we would send the referral in and it would go through the provider. We would find out later on um, whether they were accepted or not. We would then go out with um, the AOT uh, provider and um, what was Asha's? The, what was her title? She was a nurse practitioner. A nurse practitioner. We would go out almost with the whole team. And it wasn't always necessarily to do a soft handoff, like, okay, here you go. We're, we're rid of them. You deal with them. Um, majority of the time, all of my success stories um, through the AOT program were we worked in collaboration with AOT for the better part of a year. Just going. Um, because some of them were violent offenders. Um, one of my success stories I want to share, and then I'll give it to you and I'll be done. But he was a, a violent, violent offender, um, uh, suffered from schizophrenia, uh, meth, methamphetamine abuse. His mother became the target of his violence. Um, elderly female, we tried to do everything we could to mitigate, to help her. She refused to move from her home. Um, we worked with AOT program. This, this male subject had stabbed a police officer in the past. Um, the police officer in turn shot him. He survived his wounds, but obviously he didn't trust law enforcement after that. But somehow through our unit and the collaboration of our unit with our clinicians and with the AOT program, I was in shock. I worked this guy for months and months, and I just was getting ready to throw my hands up and say, he's going to end up shot again, dead or in prison. 
or long-term mental facility. And the AOT program, we worked in collaboration for the better part of a year. And I have not heard hide nor hair from him since uh, in the judicial system or the hospital system. And that's just one of many. But that's, um, I don't know if you guys have any questions after I've, <laughs> but they just wanted me to talk about how law enforcement can collaborate with uh, AOT to help the behavioral health community. Because like the judge said here, you know, we all do care. We all see the same people just in different, you know, times of their crisis. And normally we're the bad guys and we're changing that. And I love it. So I love the AOT program. Woo well, my name is Michael Lucero. Can you guys all hear me? Um, I'm one of the fortunate folks out there as, that as a behavioral health provider that I get to work alongside law enforcement. And as we've seen in recent years, there's been talk of moving away from law enforcement responding to behavioral health. And we're actually implementing a model in Albuquerque that, do, that does just that. However, um, we're a time-tested and proven co-response model. Um, our, our unit has been around 15 plus years, am I right, Sarge? Um, and we've been working, like myself, a civilian clinician uh, who's independently licensed in the state of New Mexico can issue certificates for evaluation. Um, because of our experience, we, we know the, the treatment modalities, the, the resources out there to connect folks with the appropriate care. And that's one of the unique pieces about what we're doing, is we are a diversion program, which is exactly what AOT is talking about, but we've used AOT as, as an additional tool in our tool bag. Um, we, we extensively use ACT programs. Um, as, if you're a provider, you're probably well aware of how that works, but when ACT doesn't work, when traditional outpatient care doesn't work, when traditional med management doesn't work, when inpatient uh, substance abuse rehabilitation doesn't work, or folks are not receptive, or folks are just not ready to change, this is another tool in our tool bag. And we have seen it over and over again, working as frontline workers. Uh, Detective Bailey, I think she kind of is minimizing our, what we do. No, we don't respond to 911 calls, but our colleagues who are a part of our same unit, which are also a co-response unit where we have ECIT officers and clinicians teamed up responding to 911 calls and writing certificate for evaluations when folks are dangerous, when they're dangerous to themselves or others, um, and taking them into the hospital, we are getting those referrals. And we, as the research shows, folks are most vulnerable when they first get out of the hospital. They're most vulnerable to suicide. They're most vulnerable to relapse, relapse in symptoms, relapse in substance use. And many of the times, I would say 95% of the time of the folks that we're working with in the Albuquerque community, they're co-occurring. They have both. And sometimes they have numerous diagnoses. And so having this additional tool to use, as well as being able to spend time. We don't have a time limit, limit in our unit. We don't have a set, for some providers, we, we do treatment plans and we look at it every three months and then we reevaluate it. We don't have that in our unit, which is absolutely unique. We don't have a set time on how long we can work with somebody. So if it takes a year, if it takes two years, in some cases, even if it takes three years, we're there. Folks do well. We can make them inactive. And then sometimes things, as we all know, with life, life changes. And sometimes we get stressed. So we can come back. We've already established those relationships. We've established that rapport. And one of the big things for our department is, and with most police departments nationwide is, there's staffing issues. There's not enough police officers to take calls for service. And that's the case in Albuquerque. We don't have enough officers. So our job also is to reduce those calls for service. 
when folks are high utilizers of 911, utilizers of calling the police department or the fire department, um, we're there to try to reduce that. But a big thing is we're there to reduce use of force. We don't want folks getting hurt when they call 911. We don't want folks getting, losing their life because they're in crisis. And one of the things that we've been so successful of is in, a, in our unit, out of the thousands of home visits we do every year, I would say we have less than 1% use of force, which is pretty incredible. So we also follow our consumers through the AOT program. And many times when we've made those referrals, and I've, I've been a part of the referral process, so has Detective Bailey, and when we get a family member to buy in and be the petitioner and to get them into this process and to see them through it, it's, it's made a world of difference. It's made a world of difference for our community. It's made a world of difference for the individual we're trying to help. So overall, AOT has been very detrimental in the work we're doing. And without it, it just makes it a lot harder. Because as we all know, our behavioral health system is already taxed. And in some cases, it's very, very fractured. And the pandemic really exposed a lot of those things prior it, that were already existing have is compounded and made it even worse. And I don't really, truly don't think we'll really know the true impact of what the pandemic has done to our society for many years. But AOT is, again, that tool that we have and we count on on a regular basis. So yeah, Detective Bailey, I think she, she kind of summed it up best is AOT has been a lifesaver for some of the folks in our community. And how we operate as, as a civilian clinician as well as law enforcement has made an absolute difference. So thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Lucero. Thank you so much. And yeah, with the time we have, I have a permission to go a couple of minutes over, and I mean just a couple because we want everyone to have a break and get to the next, the next session. So we're going to try to do, uh, we are going to take questions. We're going to try to just have you stand up and project. If you need a microphone, I'll get it to you. But I uh, see one, we're going to start back here in the back. I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, I want all of us who are in here have fought. I think uh, Brian and I have been at more legislatures, and he, he in particular. Uh, there is the ongoing battle to bring back the criteria uh, so that it, it doesn't have to be an It can be an individual that just the need for treatment standard. But I will tell you that it is a balance. This is, I have to be honest with it. It's a balance between that need for treatment and individuals who really firmly believe that if you're not hurting anybody, you're not hurting yourself, then you have every right to be as much as you want to be. I, I don't personally agree with that completely, okay? But as a judge, I see the balance. I see the, the tension between both. So I don't want you to think that when I'm telling you what the criteria is, I'm also saying, and that's the way it should be. But that's the way it is. So the challenge for us in this room is until it changes until we can prove to people that AOT is not that monster in the closet, okay? Until we get there, how do we work with the criteria we have now so that we save your son and your son and your son where we can? 
But that's not to say we're not going to try to do more. We need to prove ourselves, though, I think, to get there. Pass it on to you, but sure. I do want to answer that. Sure, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt. No, I want you to go. Um, it, there's no simple answer, but the first response I would say, and it's going to sound generic, but I think it's powerful, and that's data. I think it, when you're able to when you're able to demonstrate the data, and I, I know you talked about saving costs on hospitalizations, but I think when you talk about saving costs on hospitalizations and incarceration. I think people who are making decisions want to know, well, how is that working? And when you have data that can demonstrate the success in those cost reductions, in my opinion, that's your number one avenue towards sustainability, is to be able to represent through your data, this is what's happening. Because this is a situation, and this is gonna sound generic too, but it's true. This is a situation where everybody can win. It really is a situation where the person that needs treatment can get treatment, the person that has a, uh, actually talking about Arizona, because I've studied a lot of what's going on well in Arizona, Dr. Margie Balfour came to our summit. Their original litigation was called cost containment litigation. I mean, if that's your desire, like if it's treatment, whatever your desire is, this is a situation where everybody can win. And I think you can only objectively show that through data as a primary standing. There's also a there's also a strategy to, to your specific question is, how do we do it now? Uh, and I think, let me ask this, how many people are providers in this room? Okay. Of the providers in this room, every time you hear AOT, the first thing you're going to think is, oh my gosh, for those that don't want it, oh my gosh, now they're going to send me all these people, where's the funding coming? I barely have treatment for the ones I have now. Right? And when you look at a court, you say, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? I have to have an extra court and I have to do, where, where am I going to get the personnel and the resources to do this? So one of the tactics that is successful to building an AOT is finding people you already have to serve with courts that already have to order those same people. And so I'm not saying that's the only way, but it's a strategy for providers. How about this? You identify, you work with me in much the way we have collaboration with the group. You work with me to identify the top 15 people in your community so that the next time they hit a hospital, the next time they're referred to you for services, call me. I'm the one that's gonna wind up having to commit him anyway. I'm the, I'm gonna, it's not an extra hearing for me, it's the same hearing I would've had anyway. But provide me an avenue since you already have to treat them so it doesn't cost you any extra. And I already have to uh, uh, make an order so it doesn't cost me any extra. Why don't we start there? as a thought, but it takes that collaboration my good colleague here has spoken to. Here we go. So this is gonna to have to be our last question. I see Janet, and, uh, but I, I don't, may I speak for you all and say, if you're gonna be around another whole day, <laughs> if you have questions for these folks, I'm sure they'd be willing to talk to you afterwards. I mean, not, not right afterwards, but while we're here, tonight, tomorrow. Please find them, they're good people, they'll talk to you. But Janet, please. Thanks, Michael, yeah. and I appreciate the opportunity to ask questions. Just wondering how, um, you know, sort of uh, <clears throat> current narrative Because of the sort of wave of hope George Floyd, you know, 
you know, uh, activism, <clears throat> this uh, group came into the community and uh, took over the mental health space without really any kind of uh, experience and awareness and launched not a long gone this data plan that seems to take some time to like the utility ratios and the numbers to essentially wipe out our, you know, what we built in terms of uh, crisis intervention I infrastructure. Our coordinator civilianized police in order to increase our capacity for police to respond to serious crimes, mm -hmm. serious crimes, and so uh, domestic violence is not serious, I don't know. But anyway, so essentially what they've done is wiping out the infrastructure that we had and sort of a transit problem that we're trying to avoid in the first place, which is unfortunate. So anyway, we're trying to salvage something. Uh, but is that just us or, you know, are other people kind of experiencing this whole wave of we have to get police out of everything without proper contextualization that says not, you know, in proper CIP, when CIP is done properly in localities, so I say look at New Orleans, look at Albuquerque, look at Miami Bay, look at some of these places where it's being done correctly. Why, you know, why don't you model your police department after that? Let's build a, a, a hand in glove response with mental health professionals and increase you know, real good collaboration, increase our capacity together to deal with these issues. Like you said, get people into treatment, you're increasing your police capacity by right there. If they're not, you know, if we can't get them engaged, then we're just sitting there. So anyway, does anyone So, so any just so, so we're clear, it sounds like the, the question is, are other communities uh, seeing AOT impacted in any way by the larger debate around the role of police and first responders and so forth, right? Is that, okay. That's the question, and I think these folks are qualified to answer. So, yeah, please, please. I, I agree with just about everything you said. Um, we saw a tremendous increase in animosity towards law enforcement after George Floyd, um, and it was a it was a very scary time. Um, I actually it, it it gave me the ability to put my feet in police officers' boots to see what they're going through on a day to day basis, driving around in a police car and having people threaten us. Um, and one of the most dangerous places for a police officer is in there, in their police car. And for the first time in my clinical practice, which is I'm going on 17 years, that, that was eye-opening. Um, and I think that you're right. There are places out there that have, it's kind of been a knee-jerk uh, reaction um, in regards to how they're going to, you know, even the, the, the topic of defunding the police. And, which I do not agree. I think we need officers. Um, you don't want me as a clinical mental health counselor investigating a homicide. I, that's not my jam. That's not what I, you, you don't need me there. That's not what I'm there for. So, um, however, we've, we've, as a society, have put a bigger strain on officers by having them take on multiple roles of being law enforcement, being counselor, being a chaplain, being a neighbor or a, a fellow community member, and we're asking them to take on numerous roles. And so I see, I, and, and I can only speak from my, my hometown of Albuquerque in that we've kind of taken a dual approach with that. We recently developed a, a new department, which is a community safety department, which is behavioral health uh, clinicians like myself responding to lower level behavioral health calls. And as well as having this other prong approach too with the co-responder model of uh, providers and clinicians, or clinicians and officers working together to take the higher threat level calls or, or folks who are at a higher risk. Um, yeah, and there's still, folks can still access those lower level providers or those lower level risk uh, clinicians um, through 911 or through our, our non-emergency line. So I've seen how Albuquerque has been proactive and in, in how we're approaching this, and we're seeing great success. We're seeing not only is it reducing calls for service on police officers, but we're also seeing a reduction in, in folks going to jail. We're seeing folks not having to utilize emergency services, which is probably the most expensive form of healthcare out there. Um, we're seeing less strain on our 
judicial system because folks are getting into treatment and, and we're being proactive about it, but we're doing it, I think, in, a, in an intelligent way with, with as I said, a two-prong approach. So I, hopefully I answered what, what you were getting I, at. I think so. And, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And thank you, Mr. Lucero. Thank you, Judge, Judge, Detective. Thank all four of you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.